Good morning, everybody. Today is Sunday, 4th August 2019. The 4th of August 2019. And we shall read from the Gospel of St. Mark. Mark chapter 15, verse 6 to 15. Mark 15. 6 to 15, and it says, Now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. The he here is Pilate, the governor. Verse 7, And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels, They had committed murder in their rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to, to them again, What then do you want me to do with him, whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him! Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wonderful and everlasting God. Father, we thank you for your word. Word of God, descend. Holy Spirit, descend and and make this word life to us. Bring life into the words that we will be hearing, the words that we are reading, so that we can be transformed. We will be transformed by the renewal of our minds. Because when the light of God comes in, it expels darkness. When the word of God comes in, it brings life and it brings light. We depend on you, sweet Holy Spirit, to teach us, to guide us, to direct us, to explain to us what we need to know, to reveal to us what we need to know, and enable us to use what we learn and live accordingly for your glory. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Okay. So, the title I want to use today is Your Love Compels Me. Your Love Compels Me. And that is actually taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 14 second sorry second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14 second Corinthians 5:14 for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all then all died. Okay? The love of God compels us to judge this way. That if one died for all, then all died. So, what we are looking today is the love of God. The the, the power in the love of God. The, this, I would I would Say the senselessness to to human to human understanding, the utter senselessness of God's love. 
because he he loves to have fault, in my opinion. Not not that it's bad, but unless we see how much God loves human beings, we 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 will not understand why he does what he does. Because the way we think is not the way God thinks. The way we love is not the way God loves. So until we start to to tap into his kind of love that has no boundaries, no limitations, no he, he just loves you without without uh, uh, um, fault. He loves you without fault. Imagine this is somebody 2,000 years ago. Let, let me just say 2,000 years ago because it started now. I'll get to that. Human beings have always sinned. Human beings, the, the nature of the fallen man is sinful. And God in his love did not allow us. I mean, he did not have to keep us. But because he created us in love, he makes sure that his will remains. So that even when we offend him, he looks for the solution to, to take away that offense. He does not treat us as we deserve. Otherwise, none of us would stand here or, 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 or be here. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God became sin so that he can wipe away the sin of humanity. That is the same Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We really need to see the, the endless love of God. And because it it's so meaningless, some people, you know, when people are so so hung up in their way, so 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 tied up in their way of thinking. They can't even forgive themselves. And that's why they think, how can this God forgive me? They forget that this God is bigger than their sin. This God is bigger than their brain. This God knew what they, they did before they even did it and still did not kill them. So the divine exchange is so powerful that a sinful God had to become sin so that the sinful man can become righteous. He just exchanges himself. Give us righteousness and takes his sin because he can swallow up sin. That's the point. He can, he can swallow it up. And, and once you accept his righteousness, it's as if you never sinned. But Satan wants us to live in that knowledge. You are a sinner. You sin from the one because Jesus says he's, he's, he's a liar and a father of all lies. He has lied from the beginning. So he wants us to think that we are like that. But we are not like that. We only became sinful because of his deception. God made us perfect. And that's why God wants us to come back to that perfect lifestyle. But Satan, because he knows he's doomed, tries to tell people, no, you've sinned. You are a sinner and you'll die a sinner and there's no hope for you. That is his portion, not your portion, not my portion. We were born perfect. We disobeyed. But God said, okay, I love you so much. I'm giving you another chance. I am God. I can swallow up sin. So I will come take your sin away and give you my righteousness. You just need to accept it. You, just, you, you have to choose to accept it. 
So you leave it. It's not by force. I'm giving you an opportunity. So this divine exchange that we normally think began only 2,000 years ago, it did not begin 2,000 years ago. If you read Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 17, you will see that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, which means God knew before he created you before you came into the world, that you were going to sin, and he already provided the, the remedy for that sin because of his love. If we are, you know, those of us who are parents, you can see when your child is going to do wrong or they are running around and they are going to fall down. You can see it ahead of time, and we, go, and, and we are still in the flesh. So if we can see that, and we are telling the child, stop you fall, stop you hurt yourself, and they are laughing around and jumping around, sooner or later, because you, you have that mind, you can see it ahead of, of that child, that thing will happen, and you say, uh-huh, I told you so. But you don't, you know, kick the child out of the house. You, 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 they'll still cry and come to you, and you take them and pet them. So if we who are sinful can do that, why do we think God is not much, much, much more than that? You tell a child, don't do something. They go ahead and do it. They come back to you crying. You take them in your arms and still love them. And we are sinful in nature. So we need to switch our minds. We really have to, 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 you know, like Paul says, do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Think it through. Use the examples around you. You will see that, you know, you see the love of God. And you see how you do it in, even in yourself as a human being. Jesus says, you who are sinful, if your son asks you for bread, you don't give him stone. So why do you think God will not do better? If you don't give wicked things to your own child that you love, why do you think God is going to give you evil? He paid the price because he loved us. So salvation didn't start 2,000 years ago. It started long before. Revelation 13, verse 8. All who dwell on earth, I'm just starting, I'll explain. All who dwell on earth will worship him. Him, him here is not Jesus. Him here is the beast, okay? All who dwell on earth will worship him whose, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain before the foundation of the world. So when this beast comes, if your name has not been written in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of time, you think that he's, he's the one and you worship him. I hope I'm making sense. I, that's why I like to read more so that it, it flows. So let me just read from verse 4 of Revelation 13, okay? So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. That's what the wicked does. To blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. 
it was granted to him for a reason it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them it was granted it wasn't by his power that he did it like Jesus told Pilate if you were not given this power from above you would not even have this chance to talk to me so God does certain things that you will never understand except you search like now if you don't search it through when bad things happen to you you say why but it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority was given him over every tribe tongue and nation and all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of lamb of, of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world so if you don't know what we are talking about now and the beast comes and he starts to rule because of the obvious power that you see that he has you fall down worship him thinking that he is the one but once you know the truth and you are liberated you will not do it because knowing the truth is that your name has been read in this book of life of the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world so god knows ahead of time what we are talking here has not yet happened and god knows ahead of time we are privileged in this dispensation to know this because when daniel saw it god told daniel seal it up until it came to john after jesus had been glorified so now we know that's why i said this game is rigged and if you are wise go on the winning side it doesn't matter how bad it looks to the physical eyes it is not the truth the truth is only christ they shall know the truth and the truth shall set them free jesus is the truth or is truth to be more direct revelation 17 as well verse 8 again says the beast that you saw was uh, sorry the beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit you see where the beast comes from out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition and those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is you see, you see? so there's there's a, a camouflage there is this deception the beast that was and is not and yet is so your eye is seeing him but he's not because god will throw him there to the bottomless pit and he will go into perdition because he's appearing to be but he's not we, we, we can you know that that's for bible study time and verse 14 of the same chapter 17 says these will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them for he is lord of lords and king of kings and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful you see if you are not chosen you won't know this and this is why it's good to tell people so that they don't you know get deceived by by the lies of satan And which also takes me to Genesis chapter 3. I, I have to lay this foundation. Jesus wasn't just 
you know, they didn't just come 2,000 years ago. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Genesis, right at the beginning. Genesis 3, 20 and 21. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So what I'm saying is that God knew about our sinful nature, yet he chose to love us and make all sorts of sacrifice to preserve us. When Adam and Eve realized they had sinned and they were naked in verse uh, 7 of, of the same Genesis 3, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Fig leaves will dry and brittle and keep them naked again and again and again. They sinned. They tried to cover it up, but their, their, their mind, their, their senses, their level of wisdom only went to fig leaves. What did God do? He sacrificed an animal. What does that animal represent? The sacrifice of Jesus for you and I. God does it better. He does it with love. He has to sacrifice something. God had to make tunics of skin to clothe them. Something more permanent. Something secure. But there couldn't be any tunics of skin if an animal wasn't sacrificed or, or you know, an animal was not killed. So all the sacrifice of animals you see in the Old Testament, it, they all, you know, point out to Jesus. The, the sacrifice, the Jesus came and did the one and only sacrifice that made sense. All along, we saw fig leaves. It is only Jesus that comes with the permanent solution. Fig leaves will dry. You go back and do it again. Go back and do another one. That's, that's, that's what the, the, the Israelites were doing. Every year sacrifice, every time sacrifice, kill animals here. Yeah. Only Jesus came and made all that permanent in one go. So from the beginning, we can see the love of God displayed for mankind. Jesus is that one and only sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus is the only one that makes sense because he does it once and for all. So the whole Bible as we read, as we study, is God giving us chances, opportunities. And once you start to understand, you know that it, it's really mind-boggling. Why would this God love human beings so much? Why would he want to give me chance and chance again, opportunity and opportunity again? to see his love, to accept his love, to live with him, to enjoy his love. Why doesn't he just say, okay, go, I created you, I can create another one. He could have done it. Why go into all that trouble? Because he wants to show you his integrity. I said it and it will be, and I'll do anything because I'm God to make sure that it happens. If only you will cooperate with me. That, that's all. If you cooperate, there's nothing that is too difficult for me. If I'm in, in the depths, Psalm 139, David says, your spirit is there with me. Where can I go from your spirit? 
to God knows what we do before we do it, but he still loves us. And he has already provided the sacrifice for our sin. We just need to open our eyes to see it, open our heart and love him and accept his love. People find it difficult to believe in the love of God because they, they, they find it difficult to even love themselves. They can't imagine how someone can forgive them of the very thing that they can't forgive themselves of. That's why it's difficult, but just let go. He didn't do it because of your brain. He did it because of his love. Your brain will not get it. Just start to open your heart and let him fill your heart with his love and then your mind will be liberated and then you can see it. God is not man. God is love. And it is that love that compels us to learn to love as well. If he does not fill your heart with his love, his kind of love, you cannot know what love is. So until we, we dig into his word and, and are enlightened by his word, and then we understand the depths of his love for us, that's what now compels us to want to love him as well. I did all the wrong, yet someone else steps in and pays the price and not just pay the price with silver and gold and dollars and pounds, he pays that price with his life. It's not gold and silver that redeemed us. It's the blood of Jesus. He paid the price of your sin and the price of my sin with his life, with his blood. Life is in the blood. When God killed the animal and made skin, blood had to flow. You cannot kill an animal without blood. You cannot kill a human being without blood. That's why Jesus had to shed so much blood. Pilate was even surprised when, when um, um, what's his name, Joseph? The one who that uh, gave his grave, that gave his tomb for Jesus. When he went and said, I want the body of Christ so we can bury him. Pilate is like, is he dead already? He, he receives so much pain that none of us even can imagine. And thank God, God, does, God doesn't give us the capacity to imagine that kind of pain. He did it for you. He did it for me. That is why love, his love in our heart has to compel us to want to, to love him. Learn to love him. Why, why would I commit a crime and somebody I don't even know? Imagine you are in court. You are, the, the judge is there. The jury is there. They are judging you. They, they declare you guilty. And then somebody just steps up and says, no, I'll take it. I'll take his position, I'll take her position. You're like, what? Why? No, I'll do it. You see, it doesn't make sense. Until you learn to accept it, that that person has the power to, to absorb that sin and turn it to something precious. Because he gives you his righteousness. He wants you to be free. So if we look at Mark 15, it was not Barabbas that was released. It was you and I who were chained, who were bound, who, who lost our minds. And Jesus took your place on that cross and Jesus took my place on that cross. It wasn't, <coughs> excuse me. It 
just like we read about the fig, fig leaves and, and, the, and the animal skin. It's the same thing. Barabbas is only playing the, the part. Put yourself in his place. You might think, oh, but I never kill somebody. But sin is sin to God because he's a holy God. If you've ever told a lie, if you've ever thought in your mind, if you've ever had a bad thought or spoke something nasty, you're a sinner. Sin is sin to God. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is why it says, For he who knew no sin was made sin, so that we, the sinners, might become righteous. You cannot be righteous on your own. It is the righteousness of Jesus that you put on, that you accept, that takes away your sin and makes you righteous. So salvation is an invitation from God. God knows what you did before you did it. All he is doing is give you another chance. He is providing the genuineness of his love for you. Or, or sorry, pro proving. He's proving. He wants to prove the genuineness of his love for you. That is why he says, here is my gift of salvation. You have sinned, but I'm ready to take it away. I'm ready to forget it. I'm ready to wipe it away. So the cross is the ultimate proof of God's love. The cross is the ultimate love statement from God. I love you. How much? This much. He spread his hand on they, they pulled his hand so much that it it it, it cracked. I love you this much. That is the ultimate love statement. But he still doesn't force you to accept him. He says, you choose. Once you come to the knowledge, think about it and make up your mind. I have seen your wrongdoing. I have paid the redemption price. I've paid the ransom. I will remember your sins no more. I choose not to remember your sin. If you acknowledge that you are a sinner, you come to me in repentance and let that priceless water and blood that gushed out of the side of Jesus on that cross wash you clean. If you would just step under the shower of that blood and water that gushed out of the side of Jesus, you will become so clean, it's like you have never sinned. That is the, the divine exchange. That is the provision God has given for, you know, in exchange. His question is, do you like the offer? Will you take the offer? I'm not forcing you, take it or leave it. If you take it, the burden of guilt, the burden of shame, the burden of confusion that, you know, weighs us so much down that it, it even leads to physical illness, all that will be lifted. If you want to think in your human mind, that still sounds like too good to be true. And yes, if you think from the human mind, it sounds too good to be true. But why not give it a chance? It is your choice to make. So be wise about the choices. The fear of the Lord, that is the beginning of wisdom. Once you are true to yourself and you agree that there is 
some behavior issues in your life, some attitude issue in your life. You don't have to go and, and murder somebody. Things in, in, in your life, thought patterns that you would actually like to change, and yet you've been struggling to do so. You determine to let it go, you make up your mind, you promise yourself, I'll never do that again, I'll never think like that again, I'll never say such things again. You may succeed for a week, you may succeed for a few days, you may succeed even for one month or a year, but eventually you become powerless against those things. And that is why it is time to hand them over to Jesus. Because he paid the ultimate price. The once and for all price. You don't have to keep going back. He will take those issues away. Flush them out of your life. And you will be like new. When God forgives you, he doesn't patch you up. You are a new creation. And that's, that's still in that uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5 that we, we talked today. So verse, verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Once you have passed out of it, you can't go back to it. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. We, our minds has been renewed. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things. Don't let the enemy come back and say, I know what you did two years ago. Tell him that person is dead. I'm born again. I'm new. I don't even know who you are talking about. All things. All things means all things. If anyone, anyone, anyone is in Christ, he is a new crea a creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That is why some people think that Christians are beside themselves. Why wouldn't you be beside yourself when you understand this type of love? Why, why wouldn't you be beside yourself? Oh, haven't you gone a little bit too far? What did David say? I will be even more undignified than this. Dancing before my Lord. If, if that hurts you, what, watch me dance for my God. That was the key. So when somebody says, Haven't you, don't you think you've gone a bit too far? Tell them you've not even seen anything yet. Because you don't know what I know. That's why I've, I'm even con you know, containing myself. I'm trying to behave in front of you. Watch me when I'm with my brothers and sisters in the Lord. What do we do? Because they get me. You don't get me. Yeah, that's, that's what the world thinks. Christians act somehow. They are beside themselves. They, they take it too far. I was with one Christian one day. He just started laughing for no reason. For no reason? When I remember all that the Lord has done for me, I start to shout for joy. That's why I smile without an obvious reason to people. Because inside of me, I'm bubbling with joy. That's, that's what that same Second Corinthians is saying. If you read from verse 18, he says, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. It's because of you I'm trying to even contain myself. Because 
with God, I have to be beside myself. Why, why would he love me so much? For the love of Christ compels me because we judge those that if one died for all, then all died. So the, the old me is dead. I'm new. Somebody just took all my wrongdoing, whoosh, flushed it out, gave me a new life. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So Jesus did not die and remain in the grave. You are enjoying that new life with him. The life that we live is new and fresh and bouncy and buoyant and beautiful. We cannot go back and do as if we did not know. We cannot go back and do as if God has not done anything for us. He paid the whole price. And that's why he refused to defend himself when, the, when Pilate and the Jewish elders were questioning him. He had to keep quiet because if he had opened his mouth, like he said, don't you think I can call on my father and legions of angels will come down and, 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 and uh, fight for me? When he told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, he said, oh, so you are a king then? He said, but not of this world, because if I was of this world, my servants will come and fight. I won't let you catch me like this. So he did it for you, and he did it for me. That's why he went to the, like a lamb before the slaughter that did not say a word. He was not there to defend himself. He had to die so that you can become like him. Sin, you know, sinless, pureless, spotless. If one died, then all died. Remember what Caiaphas said in John chapter 11. If you read 49 to, I won't, I won't go back and read there. John 11, 49 to 52, and then John 8, 12 to 14. Caiaphas said, don't you know it is better for one to die than for the whole nation to suffer? And John said he did not just say that. He said it as the high priest. He was prophesying. In his position, he was speaking. So one died for all. And all died because of him. So your life in Christ is a new life. So my question now to conclude is, if somebody has already paid the price of your wrongdoing, carried on him the weight of your sin, why are you still choosing to carry them? Why are you still choosing to pay the price that somebody has already paid? Why are you choosing to carry the weight of sin that somebody has already lifted from your shoulders. Could it be that the deceiver is still speaking lies into your ears and you are believing the lies? Could it be that you have just chosen to be miserable and unhappy all through your life while there's a choice, while you have a choice to make? So the perfect offer is available. Victory has already been won because Jesus knew what he was doing. He did not remain on the cross. He did not rot on the cross. Neither did he remain in the grave, nor did he rot in the grave. Jesus is alive. And he wants to give you his life. That perfect life, that righteous life, that life that just makes you giggle when nobody's tickling you. That happiness that flows from within that people can't understand. 
So, do you want to live that kind of life? Are you compelled to try him today? We'll end it there. It is his love that compels us. Are we compelled to try to change our lives in him, not on our own? Let that love compel us to make, make a decision to say I've suffered long enough and enough is enough I want to get out of this misery let us pray Father we worship you we honor you we thank you thank you for this love thank you oh Lord for sending your only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life thank you lord for reminding us today of the availability of this promise thank you father for giving us chance and chance again opportunity and opportunity again and today is one of those opportunities you are reminding us the offer is still on the offer is still available. Make up your mind before it's too late. Holy Spirit, we just ask you to cement us in Christ. Never let us be parted from him. Help us to be rooted in Christ. Don't allow the corrupt world to corrupt us. Don't let us be contaminated with what is happening around us. Never let peer pressure, father, mother, whoever, loved ones, husband or wife, talk us out of the joy that you've put in our heart. They may not understand it, but we do. So Lord, we ask that you keep us in that love. And may that love continue to compel us to learn more and more, to know you, and to want to be with you, and to want to love you as well. Thank you, God the Father. Thank you, God the Son. Thank you, God the Holy Spirit. One God forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen.